Hey, we're Fatchomatic Off Grid. I'm Esther. I'm Nick. And we're going to answer another question today. We got an email from Daryl, who is interested in off grid living and um, was curious to know some of how we chose and bought our land. Now, that's a question we get a lot. And to be honest, we've kind of avoided answering it, I think, for different reasons. I just don't think that we are um, exactly the path to be emulated necessarily on how we bought our land. We're by no means experts. So when people ask us for advice on certain things, we can speak from our experience, I guess. But uh, we certainly weren't, you know, we're not uh, rural real estate consultants at all. Uh, but we had a pretty good experience, you know, that we went through, but it was uniquely ours. Yeah, and we're also not really off-grid experts, which is funny for us to say when we have an off-grid YouTube channel. But what we really like to do is to tell the story of our family and to talk about some of the concepts and some of the, the joys and adventures of it. We tend to be a little bit more careful about giving advice. Um, but here's the email we got from Daryl. I had to put his questions on paper because we're using our communications device to record. He asked, where do you live? What regulations have you had to adhere to? Did you buy the land? And how much land do you feel you need? So where should we start? Uh, where we live. We live in southwestern Idaho. And um, as far as uh, building regulations, uh, <clears throat> Those rules are determined by county in Idaho, probably like they are a lot of places. Um, and our particular county um, is, is relatively lax on building regulations. They have not uh, adopted building codes, um, but we did have to do a uh, building permit with the county planning and zoning so that they know where the building sits and uh, to give us a physical address um, and just to have a record of where we are, and of course to collect a little bit of money from us. But it was relatively um, low stress. Uh, the drawings I submitted were really not very detailed at all. They're not going to go through a structural analysis of the building. They just want to know what you're doing and where, and uh, get their little chunk of change. Right. Did you buy the land? Yes, we did. Yes, we bought our land. Um, we don't necessarily have any aspersions to cast on those who um, who try to do this kind of living on land they don't own, um, but it wouldn't have been the right choice for us at all. We, we had been renters our entire adult life, and so we were really seeking some permanence. Uh, every rental home that we were in, you know, I always had the impulse to make improvements to um, and it just felt like, for one, we were putting our, throwing our money away and throwing our efforts away in that, in the end, we really took nothing away from any of those, um, except having a roof over our head for that period of time. So we wanted this to, uh, be different. We wanted to have a feeling of permanence and see our efforts, um, sort of pay off. Yeah, and I should be clear that I, what I was kind of referencing and not directly saying um, was to talk about the option of squatting or using land illegally, which I think some people do do, and I don't necessarily want to get into the politics of whether or not that's okay, but that would not have been the right choice for us and what we wanted for our family. We have been renters, and you know, sometimes that's where you're at, and you can do a lot of good self-care and... Uh, earth care and just life self-care even in a rented space. We rented for three years in the suburbs of Boston and we just have this little tiny yard. But I tell you what, that entire yard was became garden and by the end of our time there it was producing as much as we have as much as we are now. Um, we have a lot more space now but we haven't had as much time to get systems in place. And I I really um, respect and support those of you who are suburban suburban gardeners. You know, I, I, props to you. And we did that when we were renters. It was very sad when we moved out and the landlord asked Nick to 
tear down all the garden boxes. That was a hard day. <laughs> okay, what else? How much land do you feel you need? Um, well, you know, our process for sh uh, shopping for the land was, I, I wouldn't say it was exhaustive. We did look at a number of, uh, of places, all in the, I don't know, two to 10 acre size, somewhere in there. Um, but there was a specific thing that we were looking for, and, and that was for, for me and for the project that I wanted to do, and that was trees. Um, so if we had 10 acres and it was very thinly forested, that might work, but we found three acres that was pretty densely forested with the species that um, were useful to us, uh, Douglas fir and Ponderosa pine. So, um, and that's pretty common uh, in the area where we live. Those are species that are common. Um, but just looking at the piece of property itself, it looked like there were enough trees to work with for the home and beyond and still feel like you lived in the forest. So backtracking a little to the whole question of buying land for off-grid living or self-sufficiency or homesteading, um, we, so I know I said I wasn't going to give any advice, <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know, but I would say that the most important thing you can do is to envision what you want out of the land. Because the more articulate you are about what you want, the better decisions you're going to be able to make about which parcel can do what you need it to do. Just think, speak, thinking in terms of kind of two acres versus three acres, which is what we have versus 10 or 20 acres. If you're entering into a homesteading or particularly if you're trying to do edible landscaping or permaculture and your skill level is similar to mine and Nick's or less, you don't need more than three acres. Three acres is a lot to manage. And earlier in the video, I gave a shout out to people who are doing a lot with a yard. Um, if you've done, if you've, if you've done edible landscaping in a yard and you feel like you have those skills and you then you have an idea of how much land you want to do that kind of work to, how much land you want to manage. If you want to have flat land with a tractor, you can do 20 acres, you know, because you're managing it with a, with um, a machine. If you want to have cattle or uh, horses, then the acreage is going to come up um, if you are doing small scale landscape gardening, you really don't need very much land to both feed your family and really take up all your time um, and expertise. And we had a vague idea of w what we wanted to do with it. We really didn't think we'd want to raise cattle necessarily, so we knew we didn't need um, pasture land. Um, uh, we knew that our, our uh, animal uh, raising it would be in sort of small operations. And uh, you also make a trade-off when you're looking for forested land. Um, it's likely to be steep, like this is, which really doesn't lend itself to larger live, livestock. So we kind of, we had that in mind when we started looking at mountain properties. Right, so when our biggest priority, I know Nick just said this, but I want to make it clear again, when we were choosing land was a place where Nick could build this timber frame home that we're now sitting in. That was our number one priority. So we, we made some choices that wouldn't be best for someone for whom gardening was the first priority. I got some advice from a, an organic farmer not too far from here, when we first were moving out here, and I was saying, yeah, you know, we're gonna wanna grow as much of our food as we can, and I just showed him pictures of the lot, and he said, good luck, <laughs> which, you know. Yeah, and it is challenging for, for that, and for, I mean, for a lot of the same reasons for doing really productive solar, but it really just is the place where we wanted to be. So I, I guess I just wouldn't be as happy, you know, down in the valley where 
where soil is awesome and light is plentiful. Um, uh, so we, you know, you just make some trade-offs as far as um, what you really want to be doing, where you want to spend your time, and uh, what you want to try to achieve. And there's also just an element of love. I mean, you, for us, choosing a piece of land is kind of like choosing a mate. We're here to stay. And so we love what we love about our land and we forgive what we don't love about our land because we're looking for permanence and we're looking for that, that the spiritual and emotional and mental health that comes from being tied to a piece of land. So we have, we've chosen this land and it is what it is and we're going to work with it the way that it, that it is. We recently, uh, just this year, came up with the question of whether we should buy two more acres and we wouldn't have been able to buy it in the clear and we would have, it would have expanded our land from three acres to five. And it was a real test of our value system because we definitely had that impulse that I think a lot of Americans have. And, you know, um, getting bigger. Right, getting bigger and thinking we're only two acres away from National Forest, so it would have, it would have butted us right up to the National Forest. And it would have just felt bigger and we would have been able to protect that land from anybody else building there and being in our view. And... And the impulse was really strong to go into debt and get that extra land and be bigger. And um, after thinking about it, we realized that for us, that wasn't the right choice. Right. There's something to be said for just, um, well, we've said this a lot of times, just feeling like you have enough. Um, and this, these three acres, we, there are parts of it that we haven't done anything with just because we haven't had the time yet. So um, uh, I don't feel like we, we needed to get any bigger. We had enough to deal with as it was. Right, so let me give you kind of the stats of our land so you can understand when we say there are things about it that we don't like. Let, let me give you some, some specifics. Okay, so we have three acres. It is all on an incline, but there is some terrace work, terracing work that was done before we got here. So some dirt work to terrace it. Our entire hillside is north facing. Now, north facing is it's, it's interesting because it's, I think part of the reason why I like our land is that it's a north facing mountainside because we have the kind of um, intense, majestic feeling of being on a mountainside without the harsh sun. Um, and we're, we're, often in that kind of shaded indirect light feeling, which as a very artistic person, it feels nice. Um, and the vegetation is different than a lot of properties that uh, have more exposure. You know, we get a lot more lush green uh, plants around here, just the natural vegetation. And that just um, uh, is, is more pleasant to me. Um, but with the north facing, it is hard to do effective solar, but we'll, we'll overcome that. Right. So we're north facing and we're wooded, which affects our ability to light a garden area and affects our ability to light solar panels. And so when you look at our priorities and you see that, that we spend a lot of time just trying to experience the joy and abundance of the natural world, we spend a lot of time building this house, um, we spend less time... Well, we are, we are working hard at gardening, but it hasn't been our kind of forefront push. Um, and then also it took us until year three to even put in any solar at all. You can see that we're true to our own value system all the way through from when we bought the land to how we're, how we're dealing with it. We also live in a place that has, this, has seasons. We don't have really intense winters. We're probably zone 4C or 5A, um, which depending on where you're living, you know, I don't, depending on your experience, could seem very extreme or, or not at all extreme. Um, but we also have low rainfall. We have 10 to 12 inches of rainfall per year. Um, so if you're thinking about a place where it's easy to grow a lot of food, no, that's not us. So I told you about the hillside. I told you about north facing. I told you about the rainfall. The other thing that made this property right for us was all of the infrastructure work that was done beforehand. Um, so it was owned for almost 30 years uh, by a guy, you know, starting in the early 80s. Um, 
he did all of this uh, dirt work, the terracing that Esther talked about. Uh, so the, the home site was leveled, the, the spot where the garden is was leveled, the yurt site, all of that stuff. We really haven't changed the shape of the land uh, much at all because so much good work had been done to it already. Um, he also did the water infrastructure, developed the spring, built our pond, um, built the lower pond, put in a septic system. Um, he did all of the advance work to um, transform it from just a bare piece of land to a buildable site. Um, so, uh, and then he, he did that for 30 years and even did some gardening and had some irrigation in, but never built on the property. Um, he stayed here in a, in a camper uh, just seasonally. So, um, when looking at listings um, uh, for mountain properties, it was really attractive that it had all of this infrastructure work done and it was kind of ready to go for us. As far as the water goes, we haven't, we've had to do very little and we've just kind of shown up and had drinkable water on site which is huge. Um, so the, it had a very uh, attractive uh, list of amenities um, as, as we were sort of scanning through listings. But there are also, I mean, there are advantages to disadvantages to land that somebody has done some of the work on. And that's actually true right in the area where we're at. So we're about an hour outside of a major um, town and we're right on the edge of the National Forest. We are just barely off the power grid. So if you were to go to our closest neighbors a third of a mile away, they have power. And we're in kind of a strip, and we're also in an area where there's no um, housing group, what are they called? When people get together and have rules? There's no HOA and there's no covenants or restrictions. So that was attractive to me as well. You know, there's nobody that we answer to as far as what animals we can keep or what color our house can be painted. We just had to dump our camera data. We don't have enough room on the camera to take this long of a conversation. Um, so I was saying that we have some eyesores on in our area. Now that's related to being only an hour outside of the city. We chose that on purpose as much as we want the remote lifestyle so that we can rebuild and change some of the rules of society that haven't been working for us. We don't want to have to be completely alone while we're doing that. Right. Complete isolation is not what we're going for. So the advantage of being, if you call it an advantage, of being only an hour from really what's a major city um, comes with this disadvantage that this, this area is, has been pre-owned. This is not wilderness that we live in. I know it gives kind of that feeling of wilderness because we have these tall trees and because we're off the power grid, um, but we're not that far away from human habitation. Right, so I guess it, it goes without saying, pretty much anywhere you live, you'll have to deal with neighbors at some point. And we certainly do have neighbors near us. And like she said, uh, even a somewhat abandoned properties that are an eyesore, but we feel pretty isolated just because of the terrain. You know, we we don't have neighbors within eye shot. So um, driving in and out, you have an experience of going by other people's property, but once you're here, it's it's really pretty isolated and and feels nice and and quiet and our own. Um, you have anything else to add? Uh, no, just good luck and you know follow your gut when you're when you're out there looking. Right. So we're Fouchomatic off grid, and this was a Q and A. Thanks for watching. Thanks.